So welcome back, everybody. It's my great pleasure today to be talking about Q Sharp or software effort in general and this announcement that we had a while back and that last week officially we went open source. So all of our software in the QDK is now available online on GitHub um, in its entirety. We've heard plenty before about applications and what we could potentially want to do with quantum computing. So by now we hopefully have some ideas and some inspiration on the problems we might want to tackle at this point. But the question is, how do we get there? These are all huge challenging problems. Um, we all like to save the world, but in the end, usually that turns out not to be quite as easy. And the way we think about quantum algorithms and we teach about about quantum and quantum algorithms today is very important for how people will think about them in 10 years or 20 years and what we build this future on, essentially. Sometimes they're very nice examples like Grover Ford, for example, that is somewhat visual in this 2D plane. You can draw some diagrams, have some graphics, but then when it comes down to actually explaining what it is that the algorithm actually is supposed to do and how it works, that usually looks something like that in detail in a classroom at a whiteboard with some formulas and a lot more detail that has that is on the slide, obviously. But if you're looking back at this nice visual um, representation of this algorithm. And if you forget for a moment all the nitty gritty details, we might want to take a step back and fundamentally think about what it is we want to do and we want to achieve to come up with new ideas, with new ways of looking at a problem and approaching a problem before we go into the technical detail exactly on which sign goes where. So if you would explain exactly what people are supposed to do based on this sphere, on this diagram. What you would probably come up is something like saying, well, you got to get yourself a uniform superposition to make sure your state has some overlap with where you actually want to go. And then we can do two kinds of reflections for a suitable number of time that will effectively rotate or state in space such that we rotate towards where we want to go. After you've done that a sufficient number of time, you can measure and get, hopefully, a state that is collapsed to what you wanted to know. I've written down, for example, here in Q Sharp how this might look like. And the nice thing is really that we still have pretty much these lines. Yes, it's maybe not entire sentences, but still, fundamentally, we can express there's supposed to be a uniform superposition. You're supposed to somehow mark where you want to go, your target state. You flag your target state. And usually that's the difficulty with this amplitude amplification kind of things. You somehow need to mark it, and that needs to be efficient. And then you can just reflect against the plane, do that a couple of times, and you're done. <coughs> so looking back at fundamentals, for example, teleportation, what we often see are diagrams like this one here. So okay, this is nice, this is visual, it's a pretty picture, it's nice to have in a paper because sometimes if you do a lot of theory, it's kind of hard to sell your papers without some pictures. So in that sense, sometimes we want to have them, but scaling up can be a little bit tricky. So if you have um, too much to draw, basically, if you have a lot of nesting, a lot of branching that here is in this classically controlled gates, actually, then it might come in a little more handy to actually have a code or pseudocode representation of it. Because at the very least, we've got if statements that somehow make it a little bit cleaner and especially if you had more than just one X or one sec gate in there. But what's more than that, it's not just about that. It's also if you look at this H and the C naught, what is it we want to do? It's not telling me a whole lot of what the intent is there. So instead of calling it H and C naught, which means a lot to everybody who has already worked in the field, but not necessarily to the people getting into it, we could instead write, well, we want to entangle two qubits. And then we sort of want to transfer and manipulate the kind of entanglement to do something useful with it. So hopefully we hope to abstract out somewhat that line of thinking, that thought to make it approachable and workable for people who have context in chemistry, have context in, in biology or anything else, material sciences, where these things may come in handy, but not necessarily the entire foundation of having had a degree in quantum information theory. 
Because when's the last time that you saw something like that? I hope some of you code, and I hope none of you had to deal with that. Or maybe you did, and you work on hardware. But basically, I'd rather write E plus B, because it's just so much faster. <laughs> so this is a basically that we want to achieve with the software that we are building. And stepping uh, back one step, uh, we've got to ask yourself, what is it we want to achieve fundamentally uh, when designing a quantum programming language, when designing a software platform, how, what expectations do we have? And on one hand, as I mentioned, in a sense, that's abstraction. That's talking about what we want to do rather than how strong the pulse sequence has to be to achieve that for a particular platform, for a particular hardware. So in a sense, we want to be able to talk about what we care about and what we're working on rather than having to have expertise in anything from superconducting materials up to number theory and complexity theory. On the other hand, they're always going to be the people who develop the algorithms, and most likely, hopefully, they're going to know a whole lot more about these algorithms than most other people who would use them as part of a, of a as building, as part of building on it and developing new ways of utilizing that specific subroutines. So we want encapsulation. And what's important usually when you have abstraction and encapsulation, you end up paying some overhead price usually because you've got all your nice transformations and then once you start plugging them together, you could probably eliminate some of it and now you've got the choice. You can write an application start to finish, given all the input values for every problem you want to solve, for every application you actually want to run on quantum hardware. That's doable if you have one or two applications, given you know, where we are currently, that's currently certainly doable. If you ever actually had a paper where you wanted to gather numerical data or something like that, you probably ran into a problem where you wrote a lot of scripts that do exactly that, that somehow test a bunch of input parameters, test a bunch of ways of plugging stuff together and so on. So there are two ways we could go. One is the responsibility is up to the developer to actually make this connection, make sure that there's no um, performance overhead to be paid from abstracting things out, which requires a lot of work or we can provide in the language the means to annotate the information, to provide the information that is necessary to automate that process as much as possible. And we chose to do the latter, and it's a very, Q Sharp is very young, a very new language. We certainly, there's the first steps done, and there's certainly a very long way to go, but this is where we want to go. <coughs> of course, Especially given the early stage of the field, given how hardware works, given that devices are probably going to be more or less reliable for the next couple of years, we do want to know that our code is correct. We've heard before that it's a large problem um, to debug quantum hardware. And you don't just have to debug quantum hardware. There's the hardware that's unreliable. There's algorithms that are usually probabilistic rather than deterministic. So there's a margin of error there as well. We can estimate kind of give guarantees with bounds. Using triangle inequality usually is the easiest way to go. The problem is these are then usually not very tight. So to make it actually usable, to actually speed up a lot, probably we might want to just try out and heuristically figure out what is kind of the, the right step size, for example, if you have a tartarization or something like that. But that requires some confidence in that what you're doing is actually what you want to do you know, in the correctness of your implementation. So in a sense, our first priority is, prior, um, is optimization, of course, making it efficient to run on quantum hardware. But once that's satisfied, as much as we can check about whether you intended to do what's going to be executed, that's also something we want to do. Furthermore, we want to have some idea about resources, about how many qubits do you need, about how long is it going to take probably once, or if you have access to quantum hardware, you're not just going to hit enter and hope for the best and see if it runs within the time that, you know, your qubits are alive, but at least you should have some idea on, on whether that's doable. And again, versatility is very important, such that we can figure out kind of incrementally improve algorithms, improve hardware, improve the ways we, we 
formulate an entire program and how we handle optimization of that program. And lastly, execution. As I mentioned, efficiency. We want to leverage the hardware that we have, given that we are very much fighting for every qubit, fighting for everything we can do. Um, we want to optimize what we have. And reliability, especially in terms of code. So this all brings me to a couple of questions that I think about a lot. And for me, it's all about information, essentially. Once when you write a program, what you have is somebody with an idea how to solve a problem in their head. Where you want to get is to somehow translate that knowledge into something that hardware understands, specifically. To do so, what we need to have is a way to convey that information. And that information can be conveyed in various ways and usually it's used and broken down and once you've used it, you know, once you've inlined something, you lost the information about where the original operation started and ended. So there's usually a trade-off. Once you've used it, it's probably no longer there. You can use it for one thing or for the other. So it's very important to think about these things, and these things specifically may be very different than in conventional compiler construction, for example. Because there are decades of research going into what we currently do to run a program on your laptop whether that's exactly the right way to go about doing it on quantum hardware, that's entirely an open question. And the reality is until we actually run a couple of things, until we have benchmarks and test suits and some research that goes into that, we won't know. So we're very early here. We make a first attempt. Our goal is to make a good first attempt <laughs> with Q-sharp to do that, to do exactly that. It's certainly something that hopefully will grow um, but also will, will evolve and morph because some of the things we think today are important may not be very important in the long run and other things hopefully pop up. Fundamentally, what we want to do is we want to reason about an algorithm and that's really what it's all about. So I'm not going to go into more details about what exactly is in the language. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'm happy to go into more specific on language features, on, on capabilities and trade-offs that we've done so far and where we might want to go. But I think the important idea is what I said before. To give the pretty picture, in a sense, we want to somehow combine some processing usually, some classical processing, um, heavy classical computation is something that generates heat, which is one of the main bottlenecks currently for data centers and anything like that. So realistically, there's always going to be a classical part to it for heavy processing. That's not going to run on your 4K or even lower where your qubits live. So there needs to be some coordination between the two. We're probably compiling it with things. With QSharp, you're not competing against high performance classical libraries for machine learning, for example. We provide arbitrary classical control flow because it's very important to reason about the program structure, essentially. But we're not going to compete with NumPy or anything like that. That's, in a sense, not um, the right expectation because it wouldn't run at the same level. And then we, of course, also want to actually execute it. And as mentioned, something needs to coordinate between what is processed where. So that's pretty much what makes our software stack. And for today, to figure out if that even is remotely reasonable, we want some tools to actually assess whether we are getting somewhere where we want to get. And we've got plenty of that. Q Sharp is one, of course. We also have got an arsenal of dev tools. Um, that are there to make it easier for people to get into it, to learn it, to work with it. Um, we've got simulation framework set up because most people probably don't have a quantum computer in their basement or access to one. So for our daily work um, basis, it's probably helpful to have some simulation capabilities. For us specifically, that means not just the full quantum state simulation, but also resource counts and anything you could do possibly to sort of get uh, as good an understanding as you can about your algorithm before you actually go and try to do something on real hardware and libraries naturally. So as far as the dev tool goes, we do provide a couple of things, a couple of integration. We're going to hear more about that also after that talk. Um, there's um, two extensions that we provide, but that's mainly you know, what we provide. We have a language server. Anything that supports language server protocol can use the Q 
can use that server to communicate with the QSharp compiler. So if your favorite editor is Emacs or um, Sublime or anything like that, we are now open source, feel free to contribute. For the simulation, as mentioned, we got a couple of simulators there. Um, we're working, we're certainly um, always listening to the ask, what the community wants and needs and would be helpful to have. And we've got libraries like chemistry, arithmetic libraries, and an awesome set of course material and exercises and the katas that Maria's gonna talk more about a little bit later um, that she's all written. This is one of our newest addition is Jupyter Notebooks. If you, the extensions are easily obtained um, by just downloading your favorite editor, VS Code in this example, go to extensions and download them. And the, how QSharp looks like is that it works more or less in a subprocessor model where you have QSharp code that is eventually supposed to be executed more or less on a quantum processor or rather the actual QSharp runtime and a driver that actually calls into that code. The driver right here is C sharp, but it could be anything in principle. We are on .NET Core, so you just need to somehow be able to call into .NET Core. And what the nice thing about that setup is, for example, for the trace simulator, you can actually configure a little bit what it's supposed to be watching. Um, also, um, some durations arbitrarily set for particular um, intrinsic operations or gates um, that give you a better idea on how your algorithm uh, might perform, how certain adaptions might impact that. To be somewhat helpful, what you can get also on one hand, here's exactly the number of gates as you see there, but also we allow you, if you run on a full state simulator, to actually dump the state, to look at the amplitudes. Um, I know it's helpful for debugging, though we're really on, from a Q-sharp perspective, we're focused on the operations, on the transformations you want to do. Because what a quantum state is, in a sense, is not relevant to what you want to do. So our focus there really is the transformation itself and how they relate to each other, more importantly. And with that, we can do some pretty powerful and cool things as we've seen one or two slides before and some, uh, as we've heard about the chemistry examples for example here. With of course all the usual tools for plotting. The whole thing comes with nice documentation. Hopefully we're always working on improving that. Um, what we have in our documentation is on one hand, getting started, kind of quickly setting up your environment, some documentations on what the libraries are, on what the language are, a detailed API documentation for everything in our libraries that is generated. Um, and that should cover the most basic things. What is also helpful, sometimes to watch for as we have a dev blog, coding contests and new language features or releases or something like that for those more invested in actual development and possibly also these tools that might be a good place to look. And there's a complete set of link that is probably good to take a snapshot of. <laughs> as I've mentioned, the open source repo the list there has gotten a little bit longer lately um, and I'm happy to show that right live. So here's um, one of our repositories that just went online last week, um, which is the compiler, kind of the core piece to actually run quantum algorithms, do development and so on. You don't need to look at the source code of the compiler and the extensions and so on. This is really if you're curious about what we do and at some point it's also gonna get you know, a little bit more clear uh, looking through the repository where we are headed and where we want to go. Um, if you find issues and things that you think should work and don't, here's a good place to file them. We've got 
a runtime repository that contains in particular also um, all of our simulators. It contains also a piece that generates C sharp because you need to execute on something. So Q sharp itself right now is um, taking text and building an abstract notion of that text. Uh, we are on the process of kind of writing uh, the actual compilation piece, breaking it down. That hopefully should happen over the next year or so. Uh, but for the purpose of executing it anywhere right now, we're pretty much generating C Sharp based on these high level data structures and leveraging the capabilities of the C Sharp compiler, which are a lot more relevant and more practical for actually running on classical hardware and on simulators than anything that we might want to do for quantum S. And there's also a third new repository, which is the IQ Sharp repository, um, which is the piece that makes the Jupyter integration possible and also kind of having Python as a driver, for example, um, easy to have. So let's, let me show you a little bit how it looks like if you're actually working with an IDE. Um, this right now is in Visual Studio, but that's purely because I happen to like it. Uh, you can use VS Code or anything like that. The nice thing with Visual Studio is you've got the unit testing framework and um, you've got the help that the editor can provide via our extensions. This is one of our katas, for example. And to show you a little bit just you know, how working in an IDE might look like. On one hand, it's helpful that you see everything that is declared in this file. You can jump to it, go to it right here. Um, as mentioned, the cards, the idea is that there are a set of tasks you're supposed to solve. So when you initially run all the tests, they're supposed to fail. And your job is to make them pass, make them green. And there's a nice set of instructions that come with it that explain what it is you're supposed to do and why we want to do what we want to do. And for example, here, create an entangled pair. It uh, tells us to actually, that we get two qubits in a zero state and we're supposed to create uh, a bell state, a particular one. We can do that right now. And as you see, as I'm typing, I do get live feedback whether what I'm typing actually makes sense. And also in particular, for example here, um, it will actually show me the next parameter. It will show the description of what that next parameter actually is supposed to be. That's all built based on documentation comments in the code. And our libraries are fairly well documented such that if you're hovering on things like on CNUP, for example, here, you do get a description of what that gate is actually doing. So we can have Q2 here, run the tests again, and we should see that indeed uh, that particular test hopefully should now pass. <coughs> And I've already filled in a third one, so having solved that one actually makes the other one pass as well. Uh, we've got all the features, for example, where you can see, well, peak where this declaration is. We see here, there's, for example, a type declaration here. It's got two items named bit one and bit two to represent the message you want to transmit. This here is the super dense coding kata. So uh, the goal is to transmit two classical bits by physically by using the resource of entanglement and physically sending one qubit. Um, so there are a couple of nice features on that the compiler provides. For example, if you forget an open directive, you see here now finding this thing. Uh, it's pretty easy. It suggests you exactly where to look for it. You can click on it. It's actually going to insert this um, open directive again, as you know from other languages like C Sharp and F Sharp, where similar functionalities are also uh, available, obviously. We're always working on improving that. Um, we've got rename, for example, that makes it fairly easy and convenient to work with. It's just writing two lines of code. It's fairly straightforward writing a couple of hundred lines of code, which hopefully uh, people working on quantum algorithms will at some point, is easier to have some support here. We have this whole thing also uh, in Jupyter Notebook format, and Maria, the next speaker, is gonna talk about it some more. I'm just gonna show you a little bit. You can actually clone, for example, 
a CADAS repository, you get an index and the list of all things here that are available. And as I mentioned, you're gonna see more about that a bit later on. As I mentioned, things are also available in VS Code. Here we see the example to actually just create a bell state and then see what the state is. We can run it with .NET. Sorry. Just .NET run. We'll do what we want to do. And what we get here is an output that is now a little bit less readable with what the amplitudes are for particular qubits, for qubit one, or rather for state one, state two, state three, state zero. And in case you were wondering a little bit how this whole thing works, for example, with Tracer, where we have branching based on measurement results, the way it's currently implemented is that when you write, for example, teleportation and you have a branching here, uh, what the tracer does is actually follow one particular execution path. And the path it follows is gonna be probabilistic depending on what probabilities have been annotated for a particular branch. So what we did here, for example, is to say, okay, here are an assertion uh, regarding what the state of the qubit should be. We can have similar assertions before branchings that basically say the probability I know from based on, on my knowledge of the algorithm is supposed to be that. And it will just probabilistically follow whichever path according to that probability. If you don't set anything, I believe it's a 50-50 chance and um, there are ways obviously to force each, each path in branching. Again, there, everything is open source. There are certainly nice things one could do with that and build on that and have a more clever way to get an entire understanding of the tree for your program. And we're always working on improving our tools. So before I go into full demonstration here, I think it's easier if I just open up the round for questions for anything you want to see, any, any other software aspects you would like to look at, and I think that probably makes more sense. No questions? So then I hope for plenty of contributions and people using it, or at the very least bug reports. That's always a good sign that people are actually using the software. Perfect. Then I think uh, we're all excited to hear more about course material and uh, how to actually use these tools. Thank you.